Wow, the place is on fire this morning, eh? Nathan Betcher set us up, and what about this band, eh? Fantastic. Now, the young people, you want to stay and hear my message. You don't want to go upstairs, do you? Isn't that right? You're dismissed. You can go. God bless you guys. Put our hands together for our young, young teen, our teenagers. Though. You may be seated. Well, I thought the Papua New Guineans were on fire. I was there for a couple of weeks uh, at uh, Port Moresby, Bethel Centre, but I've come back here and we're Melanesian now. We're on fire. It's great. Terrific to uh, be home. And it was a, a, a busy time, always intense there. And I experienced my first flood. Can you believe it? And uh, it's not supposed to be a joyous occasion, but I was really intrigued. The river overflowed. And the waters came over the edge and started flooding the compound. Jeremy Stills had that privilege. Uh, Norm Reed's had that privilege. Their houses get flooded. And I'm thinking, it's going to happen to me. And so uh, I'm out the front with the broom. I've got a video of this. You've got, we've got to see it. It might need to be a bit censored. But, uh, <laughs> but the water's coming in. And I'm thinking, man. And they said, Pastor Bill, get all your electronics and your stuff. Stick it on top of the table. And so Pastor Barnabas, the national chairman of the CRC, and I, we just started praying. We started praying in our prayer language, speaking in tongues, and, and, and we just commanded the clouds, felt like Moses, commanded the clouds to go over to the sea and dump that stuff, and then we just put our hands out and we pushed back the waters by faith to get back into the river. The next 10 minutes, nothing happened. Water's still piling up. And then Pastor Barnabas goes, look, Pastor Bill, it's going back. And we saw it retreat a little bit. So with the help of my broom, we're praying. We push the waters back. And within an hour, the water stopped. And so the flood ceased. Isn't that fantastic? Well, I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> whether it was natural or whether it was spiritual, I just want to give God praise. I didn't know my stuff wasn't wrecked. And I tell you, when the floods go through that place, it just ruins everything. But it's good to be back and to share 40 days of prayer. So I've been doing it with you while up there in Papua New Guinea. And uh, I felt after the Friday service, and we did something we don't do very often, but I felt the urge to pray for every person in the Friday service. We did it at 8.30. I wrote to you during the week or on Friday afterwards saying, look, I got this urge that we've been doing 40 days of prayer, that uh, with the nature of the message, it would be great to actually pray for every person in this place. And it may be chaotic at the end, but I think it'll be okay. So if you want to get ready to stir your heart, what miracle are you looking to God to do in your life? What are you believing for deep down? As the word comes, let there be faith that stirs in your heart. And we can ask for anything. He doesn't guarantee that we will get everything we ask. But this, we can ask for anything in Christ's name. And uh, as we have been doing the 40 days of prayer, it's reoriented us to the real priority of our relationship with Jesus. And so uh, how to pray for healing and restoration. That's my topic. Personal healing. Relational healing. You might have a physical need. You might have an emotional need. You might have a relational need. Uh, our country is in a lot of trouble. Uh, I, I've, not, I've not been grieved for our nation than over the past year, year, two years, I've really found myself interceding and praying for Australia. Some of the signs and evidences of what's taking place is people want to remove Jesus from the public square. They want to remove Jesus from, from, from their lives and I'm thinking, it's almost like you remove Jesus. You're going to let the devil come in to run amok and cause so many difficulties. But they're blinded by their unbelief. And it's not a, not a matter of reacting and, and having attitudes towards people who are not believers, but to actually, not to shout at the darkness, but it's to say, God, help me to be an emissary of light, to be a preacher of Jesus, to be a Christian that, that, that facilitates your healing, forgiving, gracious power to come upon our country. Uh, because our country is in a lot of trouble. We, we are more prosperous than ever. Do you realize that? We have had an economic boon since 1992. It's like now 17, 18 years from that terrible recession that we had in the late 80s, early, early 90s. 
Uh, we're unbelievably prosperous. Unemployment is probably at the lowest edge for many, many, I think it's below 5%. Um, our gross domestic product, we're probably the 10th or 11th richest country in the world. We're about one point, heading up to $1.8 trillion economy. Our economy is bigger than Russia's, that has 140 million people. Our economy is bigger than Indonesia's, that has 250 million people. Okay, Australia's fabulously wealthy. We're doing so well economically, and yet at the same time, we are getting sicker in our relationships. Poverty is, is spiritual poverty, moral poverty, ethical poverty is on the increase even though economically we're doing better than ever. The mental health crisis in our country is, is just stupefying the implications of it. Uh, seven or eight years ago, seven people ended their lives, chose to end their lives every day. And our government has arisen to, to the task of endeavouring to pour billions of dollars in, and maybe it would be 10 people a day. It's now gone up to eight people a day end their lives, not who attempt to do it, I was on the plane the other week and I saw Dr. Patrick McGorry, who was the, the uh, um, Australian of the Year, and he kind of facilitated the awareness of, for government to get involved with the mental health. And I went up to him and I said, hey, I said, are you the doc? He looked at me. <laughs> I forgot his name. I said, are you the doc? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you are a hero. And he goes, no, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. I said, God bless you in what you're doing. And he just kind of was a bit stunned and I just moved on because I had to take my seat. But... Um, but people like him, whether he's a believer or not, you know, kind of stirring things up to say there's a, there's a problem. People, there's a problem. Governments, that are pro they're pouring in billions of dollars. And I'm thankful for that. But you know what? Suicide's an epidemic proportion, particularly in our rural areas and among men. Marriage and family breakdowns. Uh, I mean, we know marriage and family breakdown has occurred for, for quite a few decades, but the levels of dysfunction in young people, the levels of violence that are taking place. One woman a week gets killed in our country by some mad man who somehow thinks he loves her and, and has relationship with her, but will kill her, usually because of alcohol abuse or, or drug addiction. They're usually not, not married husbands who have produced the kids. It's usually de facto's. They're boyfriends, they're lonely, and they get themselves to all kinds of difficulty, but it's just terrible. I've never seen our political fabric, our social fabric as a country, just uh, so, so fractured with intolerance, like people just so intolerant and so hateful of people who have other opinions. It's not like civilised kind of debating that takes place. Uh, we so need Jesus healing and restoring grace and power. How will our nation be healed? One person at a time. That's us here, and somehow the healing, forgiving, restoring grace of Jesus spilling out from us to others around about us. As Pastor Nathan led us to pray for people this Easter, let's believe God. This 40 days of, of prayer, we need to see thousands of people come to Christ through our witness here at Seton. It's time for a, a spiritual awakening to take place, and it's going to occur through us and our prayers as we get on fire and uh, fall in love with Jesus and become fresh in our faith, it'll, it'll have an effect upon uh, our families, upon our society. But boy, does our country need the Lord more than ever now. I want to read a fabulous promise. It's an unusual one because God gave it to King Solomon at the height of his success. He had just built a multi-billion dollar temple for God. God has always been living in a tent in the Old Testament, in a tent, the tent of meeting. And King David, his father, said, oh, it's not good that God's living in a tent when I've got this beautiful palace. Once he took over Jerusalem, the, the Jebusite capital, he conquered it, made it his capital. And he said, I, I want to put a building up for God. And as if God wants to live in a building anyway. God wants to always want to live in our hearts, our lives. But this is the Old Testament, and all the sacrificial system was still in place, pointing to the day when Jesus would come and no more killing of animals and birds, covering sin for the day or the week or the month or the year. But once and for all, Jesus would, would pay the price and that we would be reconciled to God the Father so that sin would be removed and he could send his Holy Spirit to live within us. That's, that's God's purpose. But here in this Old Testament passage... Solomon's rejoicing. I mean, he's just put up this fantastic structure. David raised the money. He put it up. And God just gives him a word. Interesting word. And I think this, this word is relevant for us today, relevant for 
the nations of the world, but through the gospel prism. Okay, you can't just apply it willy-nilly. It had a local context. It's 2 Chronicles 7.14. Some people take this and apply it and, and don't do it through the gospel prism of the New Testament. He says here, if my people who are called by my name, that's us, will humble themselves and pray. Notice, humble, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, and we'll see what, how they define wickedness in that era. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, in our New Testament context, we don't have to do anything to earn God's favour. Okay, God's favour and grace has been displayed in the person of Jesus through the cross and resurrection. So we don't do anything to earn salvation. It's done for us. Okay, but what we, I think this passage, the, the application for me is, but in our receiving the grace of God, in our receiving the gift of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, th this is the practical avenue of how faith works. How do you receive what Jesus has provided? He's not going to bash the door of our life down. He's not going to force his will upon us. Love has to be voluntary. In a marriage, if a man wants his wife to love him and tries to force it or, or the other way around, it's, it's not a marriage. Love has to be given and, and, and it flows out of, out of the heart of people because they respect and love and there's connection. If, the moment a person has to try and extract love, it's not real marriage. So God doesn't, God doesn't want to force us to love him. He wants love to be voluntary. And for us to receive what he has provided for us, I think this passage is applicable. And so let me just uh, uh, outline just four things. Firstly, humble yourself before God. If my people will humble themselves. Humility is the first step of the healing restorative journey that we must take. There can be no healing, there can be no restoration, there can be no breaking of the chains that we sang about today until a person says, you know, I'm all wrong and God is all right. And, and I just say, I, I, I can do nothing to change my circumstance, but God can change it if I agree with him, change my thinking and call out to him. And so, so we just can't approach God who's our loving and good God. And that song on the goodness of God, didn't it melt your heart? As it was singing, he's so faithful. I thought, God, I've been so faithless at times, but you've been so good. God, I've been bad at times. You know, I'm, I'm just, I've done wrong things, but Lord, you're so good. How, how you put up with me? How he puts up with us? It beats me because I don't put up with people like that. I find it hard. But he's so merciful. He's so good. He's so gracious. If we humble ourselves... And, and, and say, you know what? I just don't have it together. It's God that's made it all possible. And so we must never approach our loving and good God arrogantly or proudly or flippantly or disrespectfully or in a demanding manner, a prideful manner. God's not our servant. We are his servants. God is not a, a magical genie. Oh, I've got a need. Oh, up comes God. Help me. Or he's a celestial Santa Claus that we only approach him when we need a gift. He's a person. And through our 40 days of prayer, I hope we've kicked that one out of, the, out of the ballpark. You know, to say, you know what? We don't just worship God for the things he gives us. We worship him for who he is. Where would we be without him? And yet he loves to give us things as well. So humility is not self-flagellating and going, oh, I'm bad, I'm terrible. It's not thinking less of yourself. That's a false humility. I know people who, who you know, think they're humbled by by knocking their sense of self-worth and identity and I'm bad, I'm terrible, what my mother said to me, what my father, what people think, yeah, it's all true. It's, no, 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 that, that's your identity, your worth, your value is tied up with who you now are in Christ. You, you're made by God, you're made in his image, you're redeemed by Jesus, his son, you're filled with his Holy Spirit, you have worth and value and dignity in him. We're not talking about that, we're talking about thinking of yourself less. Not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less on a day-by-day -day basis. How do you get abiding joy outside of fleeting happiness? You've got to put Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Joy. Happiness is just so arbitrary, it's built on me first and what you can do for me, but it doesn't last, it's fleeting. A true abiding joy, love that Christ gives is one where we are actually thinking of ourselves 
less. We're putting Jesus number one. We're putting others before ourselves. And you know what? We gain so much. That's where we find fulfillment. We never arrive at perfect humility. Is there anyone here who's kind of thinks, well, I think you're wrong, Bill. I think I've made it. I'm perfectly humble. There's not an ounce of pride in me. Don't put your hand up. Don't put your hand up. I'm sure nobody is in that place. Because if you are, you can't be saved. I've heard people say, well, you know, like, it's almost like God's, I'm doing God a favor by getting on his side. And like, yeah, well, I'm a pretty good guy and, you know, God needs me. No. You're a sinner. You're destined for hell and damnation. And it's the mercy of God that saved us through Jesus Christ. And if you have any tickets on yourself to think I deserve it, you can't get saved. You've got to come to the end of yourself and say, I cannot do a thing to earn my salvation. I can only trust in him and love him who did it for me and cling on to him for dear life for the rest of my life until I go home to be with him. It's faith from first to last, depending on him. It's not my works. It's done for us. I don't have to do anything. And so anyone here who thinks I've got perfect humility, it's just showing that you have a lot of pride. James 4.6 says... And Jimmy allows it down here. This is Jesus' little brother. He says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Humility is a really big deal with God. It's a really big deal with him. He loves it as much as he hates pride. I could read a hundred scriptures on pride. It's terrible. What pride does, it does the opposite of what humility does. It forces God away from you because it's almost incompatible with his nature. Jesus, Philippians 2, how he humbled himself to come to earth. That's the nature of our Father. And the Bible doesn't say we're to pray for God to humble us. Oh God, make me humble. I don't find that. I don't think there's any prayer like that in the Bible. If there is, find one and let me know. But we're told to humble ourselves. We're told to humble ourselves. It's a choice we're to make. God doesn't do it for us. If you want God's favor, if I want God's favor, I've got to humble myself. If if, If I want God to oppose me, and oh, Lord forbid, then become prideful. In Papua New Guinea, I had a a wonderful time um, with ministering to people. And uh, there was a man there. I I don't go there to become a counselor. I don't go there to become a counsellor because I've just got too much time. Four hours teaching in the morning and then I take out the missionaries for lunch. Then at night there's a, a t- another two-hour session. So I'll probably have a, an hour and a half break or I just lie down and go, God, help me. I've got to do another two hours, you know, just to be refreshed. So, but there were a couple of situations that arose that I had to, I had to address. And, um, and there was one man that was just, he was emotionally and relationally bleeding on everyone. Like, a really, like I'm thinking, what's going on? What's going on here? What, what's, what's taking place? And so I'm just watching for the first week. I think, man, this guy is in, in, in some trouble. He, he's just reacting and, and, and he's hurting others by, by misinterpreting what they're saying and he's serving there with us. <laughs> so um, so I'm, I'm just watching and praying, saying, oh, Lord, I said, uh, I think this guy's a case. I wish Jill Steele was here. I'd put him onto her. <laughs> She's got a lot more patience than me. There's a lot, it's an onion. There's a lot of things that need to be peeled back because I could just see that he was reacting all over the place. And so uh, I just started praying for him. And then uh, he took me out. He picked me up, actually, from the hotel uh, where I was having lunch with some missionaries. And, uh, um, and it just worked out that I was able to talk with him. And um, my, <laughs> my counseling technique is good for the first hour. I can cut through to the real issue. <laughs> so I, I just took the opportunity. And the guy just started crying. And then he started sharing what happened to him as a little boy. And uh, I, I can't even say it. It's just so, so, so bad. And um, um, so as he's sharing, and he just said, Pastor Bill, what you're saying is right. What you're saying is right. Everything you've just said is right. Because I just, I spoke to him. I said, look, I'm going to speak the truth to you. But I want to do it as lovingly as I can. I think you're a fantastic man. You're doing a great job. I said, but someone's going to deck you. And it's not going to be pleasant. And some of these Melanesians are big boys. And I wouldn't mess with them. 
And well, secondly, they're going to get sick of you and throw you off the property. So something's going to happen. And so, <laughs> and in talking to him, and he breaks down. And, you know, the thing that, that came out that I, that I saw was his absolute humility. I gave him my book, The Me I Can Be. He read it twice. He's even accepted, I'm going to come to Adelaide, I'll talk to your wife. I said, fine. I said, you need to. I said, uh, you remind me a bit of her 20 years ago. I said, she can help you. She's a lot older than you. She can help you to overcome this trauma that happens because of a, of a, of a terrible dad. I said, secondly, I'll, I'll get you a book. I bought him the book, Changes at Hill by um, Dr. Klaus. I'll send you Dr. Klaus stuff. I want you to listen to everything on YouTube. Get hold of Cloud stuff. And when you come down here, I said, I'll put you onto a counsellor for a couple of times. You know, the guy said, yes, 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 yes. No pride. Total humility. And I just said, God loves that attitude in you. I said, you're going to get healed of this thing. I said, there's nothing that can hold you back. No devil's going to destroy you. You're not going to destroy your life because you're programmed to react to everyone. I said, you get th those things that you're programmed, we're going to deal with them. We're going to cast them out in Jesus' name. Treat it like a devil. And I was so full of confidence that this guy's going to get healed because of his humility when he was lovingly confronted. And I mean that lovingly confronted, not, not in any way to, 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 to vent against him. So if you want God's favour, humble yourself. If you want God to oppose you, just continue in your pride. After you've consciously humbled yourself before God, then ask God for his help. Ask God for his help. If my people will pray, they'll humble themselves if they will pray. And, and look what Jesus said about prayer. I love this. In that day, that day is this day. It's after the resurrection of Christ. It's after he died on a cross and rises again. And he says, when I go back to heaven, I'll send the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a new day. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Notice, anything, and then in my name. Until now, you've not asked. And he combines it together for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. It's really interesting. And he says, you can ask for anything, but you're not going to receive everything. Sky's the limit. You can ask for anything. But he's not going to give you everything. Because some things are not good for you. And sometimes your desire is a wrong desire. Sometimes you, you pray amiss. They're kind of self-centered prayers or you don't know the end from the beginning. He does. He's not going to give you something that's going to hurt you. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's a bit like a child. I mean, our kids, our grandkids. I had six of them yesterday or five of them at my home. It was a perpetual ask feast. <laughs> asking for this, asking for that, asking for that. And my response was, nah. Get it yourself. Oh, I'm not interested. Look, I'm busy t doing my sermon for tomorrow. I, I, you know, like, leave me alone, you little pest. <laughs> Was that my response? Nah. What if he came in, the little bloke, named after me? Oh, Papu. He's a troublemaker. That, he, he, he says, can I have a drink of that that's on your show? It's methylated spirits. <laughs> and would I say, yes, my darling little grandson, here. Would I do that? He's asking amiss. He's asking for anything, but he's not going to get everything. So you can ask for anything. That's fine. God knows. He just kind of looks and goes, yeah, all right. No, 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 no. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Next week, we'll open this up a little bit more because it's a real, if you don't get this, it'll undermine your faith. It'll undermine your faith when suffering comes because suffering is part and parcel of, of, of the human experience. And even strong Christians um, experience suffering you know bad things happen to good people and so uh, so with a child uh, you know no prayer no trust so when you ask him it's, it's learning to trust God so when our kids ask us for things they receive them from us except the things that are not helpful and they grow in their trust of their parents and their grandparents and so they're asking machines all the time and, and we continually give and continually and what's happening is a bond of trust is developing between the child and the parent or the caregiver and and so this is the same with us in God uh, we are to ask for anything we are to talk with him we're to believe for the biggest things 
And uh, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking until the door is open to you, Jesus says in in Luke. And so uh, in this way, by keep asking him, we're learning to trust him. Secondly, he says, in his name. Notice that? In his name. It's on, what do we mean by in his name? Sometimes people use the name as an incantation. Like it's not a legitimate prayer unless, oh yes, of course, in Jesus' name. Well, what it means is who he is and what he's done for us. What he accomplished on the cross for us. And the benefits that flow, it's because of him. And what he's doing for us in heaven. He's our high priest. He's our big brother. He's our good big brother. He's our friend. He's, our, he's the one that dispenses mercy and grace. He does, he's waiting for us to come to him to ask for anything and we will receive mercy and grace in our time of need, Hebrews 4 tells us. And so, so we're to ask for his help. And today, some of you have come asking for help. And you need to ask for his help and trust him. Thirdly, seek him, not the miracle. Seek the giver, not the gift. Seek the saviour, not just the salvation. If my people will seek my face, Hebrews 11 says this, God rewards those who earnestly seek him. How's that? That's what faith is. Faith, you're earnestly seeking him. It's okay and good to want miracles, and I want as many miracles as possible. I want answers to prayer today as we pray for you as you release your faith. But what's even better is for you to intimately know the miracle worker the giver of every good and perfect gift. Seeking God is not a casual part-time, something we do in our spare moments. I hope the 40 days is inspiring you in this. It's a serious pursuit. It's my primary focus. It requires intensity. Jesus said this in in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. He's not saying, he's saying, look, seek me with all your heart. And you're going to find my provisions are going to flow a lot easier when you seek me. Lord, whether this request is answered or not, I want to know you more and more. And then he says, if my people turn from their wicked ways, turning your attention from the world to the word. And this is a continual process. The world is having its influence on us. You cannot watch the medium for longer than an hour or two without an antichrist unbiblical value being spewed out onto you and if you're not discerning it's going to affect you that's why parents with kids man we have to be so careful I had a session with all the parents and the kids at the the campus and just talking about child protective behaviors and one of the things that came out was the pastors and the parents said this mobile is a gift but gee it's a source of evil the 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 pornographic images that are coming through the violent images, like now they're trying to pass laws that that, that, that lunatic in, in Christchurch, he actually had that thing on Facebook and other mediums and, and, and while he's killing people, it's being telecast and, and they took an hour or two to get it off. Now they're basically saying, you don't get that stuff off straight away, we'll put you in jail for five years. This is to the, to the Facebook and Twitter, so the governments are really going nuts over that, saying you took too long. You've got to be on top of this. We can't have traumatic images being thrown, and I think pornographic traumatic images need to be thrown out and cancelled out as well. I wish the governments of the world would do that. There's a big difference between healthy eroticism, big difference in art and other images, than than foul pornographic images that are destructive to people's understanding of sexuality and demeaning men and women. So they're, they're, they're just like, what is that about? That's nothing to do with the gift of sex. That's, that's a perversity, changing what God has made beautiful within the context of monogamous, lifelong marriage between the man and the woman uh, to what is available today. And our kids are being bombarded with it. And parents have to be on top of that and prepare their kids. What do you do when that image comes? Uh, the enemy will come. They've got cartoons now for three-year-olds, four-year-olds. They're watching their cartoons and a pornographic cartoon will come on. One of our children here was exposed to that for half an hour. And they're watching this. I didn't see it, but the, the mother told me. She said she nearly died. How did that happen? Because it's evil. The devil wants to destroy the lives of our kids. So we've got to, to realize just in that area, 
alone. The, 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 the world in the media, the media is wonderful. I'm not having a go at the media. I, I love my iPhone. It's fantastic. But it can be used for good. It can be used for, for evil. And we've got to be on top of it. So we've got to turn. He says here, you've got to turn. And Isaiah describes what wicked means in the Old Testament. Because when we think of wicked, we think of Hitler. Wicked. Evil, racist, megalomaniac, narcissist, just a horrible human being. No, no, no. In Isaiah says, you have turned from the God who can save you. It's turning from him. You, it's forgetting him. You have forgotten the rock who can hide you. Or, or, or the century, New Century Version says that God is your place of safety. And so it, it's, it's about forgetting God. And when we forget God, we start doing bad things the more separated we are from him. And the more we are divorced from Christian values and the Judeo-Christian framework for ethics and morality, we'll end up doing all kinds of crazy stuff. In the New Testament, to turn is the word repent. And again, some, I don't like the word repent. I wish we could change it out of all of our translations because it gives a, a, a negative connotation like... Oh, you've got to repent if you've done a wicked thing. A no, no, it's actually just change your thinking. Repent means, in the Greek word metanao, is to flip your mind. It means change your thinking. Shift your paradigm or your worldview. Just change the way you think about God, about yourself, about the devil, about darkness, about light. So the, the key to change and, and to, to actually adapt yourself to the word has change your thinking patterns and, and identify those things from the world that are antichrist and then imbibe the promises of God and the ethics of God into your mind to replace those negative things. So Peter says it beautifully. He describes the results of repentance. It's such a positive action. And, and look at what God does when we embrace repentance or metanoia. I, I'd like to just to put it, change your thinking and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So you just say, well, I'm wrong, and God's right, and he's provided forgiveness, and I turn to you, Jesus, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. How's that? Repent and turn. We need to repent. We need to change our thinking patterns continually. You won't experience the full favor and blessing of God upon your life if, if you're being filled with the junk of the world. You've got to identify what's junky, what's good, and then to replace it with, with what God says in his word. And so to flip your thinking and to keep ch making sure your mind is young and youthful. Ephesians 4.23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Literally means have a young, a youthful mindset. In the Greek, it actually means a young, youthful mindset. Your body may be getting older, but you should be getting younger in your attitudes. That's what repentance means. It means just keep your mind fresh. Don't develop arteriosclerosis of the attitudes. You've got to kind of get free of that stuff. Get rid of the plaques of the world, systems that will try and block you from experiencing the blessing of God. And so whether it's your life, your family, your vocation, our church, our nation, we need refreshing. And, and that comes as our sins are removed when we have turned to him. Uh, James, um, again, Jesus' little brother, he writes about how in a close community in a church, like the Jerusalem church and our church, how we can receive his miraculous provisions, particularly forgiveness and healing. And uh, he says this in James 5. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. I talk to God straight away. Have an anxiety, a trouble, problem? Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise because sure as night follows day, next week there'll be some trouble and you'll pray. Now it's time to sing and rejoice that God is good. And, and uh, is any one of you sick? Because let them call the elders of the church. Now, this is the, this is the context of a church environment. In other words, get permission from the leaders. And we do that. We allow our, our small group leaders, life group leaders to pray for the sick, anoint them with oil. It doesn't have to be an ordained pastor. But as long as the authority of the church is involved, people are not just doing their own thing. And uh, he says, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. Call Pray, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. How's that? The Lord will raise him up. And then he just goes, and if they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Like, he just throws that in. Like, I have found people that really are sick physically, that get in a lot of pain, a lot of distress, 
also get very grumpy and irritable and sometimes can develop a life attitude that turns a little bit sinful towards their spouse. I mean, I've seen that. I've seen husbands just really nasty towards their wives. Wives nasty, not because they hate them, but because of the pain and the distress. And it just becomes awkward when you're ministering to people. And you realize, well, he's actually sinning in his heart. Or, or, and you see that. You see that happening. There, there are things that happen when you're under distress. If you're under stress, if you're under pressure, if you're being traumatized in some relationship issue, it's so easy for the devil to find the fault lines and to, and to tempt you to sin. So this is part of life. Where there's suffering, there's sin. And it's almost like he just says, well, well, well if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven. That, that, that'll go to it. It's like God is so full of forgiveness and grace. Like, he'll heal your body, he'll heal your soul too. Come on, you know, like, get rid of your sin. So come into church. So people say, oh, I can't come to church because I've sinned. I say, what? You should come to church because you've sinned. <laughs> and leave your sin at the altar or in the seat and receive the forgiveness of God. I need church more than ever when I'm in trouble. And in this environment, it's better to confess, like he says here, confess, doesn't he? Read, read it on, he talks about confessing your faults to one another. I didn't put that in there. You know, it's better to confess that you're being tempted to sin with somebody that's a trustworthy person than to have to confess after you've sinned and there are the consequences that, have to, uh, that occur because of it, particularly if it's relationally oriented. And so it, that's why life groups are so important. That's why having a good friend, when you're going through a tough time, if you're going through temptation, go to them and say, Look, can I share with you? Confess to them your faults, your, the, the temptations, and, and they will help you much better before than to yield to temptation, and then it becomes a terrible thing to, to, uh, to unwind and to make restitution and all that kind of stuff. And so... So let's now seek him, church. Ask him for help. Humble yourself before him. Ask for help. Seek him. Believe he is able and willing and receive from him. And I would like us to do that right now. We have, we have nearly 20 minutes in this place before we have to pick up our kids. And what I'd like us to do, the musicians, you guys come, come forward and... Um, so my desire is to, to believe with you and to pray a prayer of faith over all of you and then for the pastors to be lined up the front here, the rows, and to anoint you with oil and lay hands upon you and to make the sign of the cross on your forehead because it's through the cross that all these provisions come. It's through the Holy Spirit, oil, symbol of, of, of the Spirit, that his life and gifts come. So let's stand together. Can we just stand? I'd like to lead us in a prayer. You don't have to. You can stay in your seat. God can touch you sitting there. But there's something about a moving, an action that causes you to move forward. Like I often, all over the world, I say to people, well, you, before we pray, can you just lift your hands like this? You might think that's strange. Why do that? I'll tell you what. Just lift your hands like this. If you're ready to receive something from him, you know what this means? I'm not approaching God like this. I'm not approaching God like this or like that. I'm, I'm submitting to him. I'm yielding to him. It's an act of humility, actually. Saying, Lord, I, I submit to you. I, I, I don't have an answer here to this relationship problem. I don't have an answer to this financial need. That, that's going to be, I, I need an answer. I need a provision miracle. You can believe for a life partner, for some of you who are lonely and you want to get married. You haven't got the gift of singleness, but you want to get married. As if God is not interested in that. He just wants you, don't race ahead of him. Submit to him. Say, Lord, I submit this to you. And then to receive the gift. He will provide for you. Miraculously. I've seen it so often. Whether it's a financial need, miracle, it might be a vocational matter that's taking place. It might be the thing of your acute loneliness and you're saying, I just want somebody that I can talk to and love and, 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 and just have relationship with. It doesn't even necessarily mean having to have children. 
if you're beyond that age. But he can provide for you. Seriously. You, you have a relationship breakdown. You've got a, a, with a son or with a daughter or with a brother or a sister, and it's hell. Relationship breakdowns are hell. It's hell. It's just awful. When there's all these things and you think, God, I don't know how this is going to be resolved. All you can do is forgive, love your enemies, pray that God will do something in your heart towards them, not to agree with them. Whatever needs you have, I want to lead you in a prayer. With hands raised like this. Father, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, who made provision for us through his death on a cross, that it was done for us, and now he is doing for us from heaven, praying for us, having sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, to represent him. Lord, you've done and you're doing risen Christ we thank you that you're there at the Father's right hand Father we, we thank you that we can approach you boldly and confidently through the worth of Jesus and the work that he's done for us and the work that he's doing here on earth through the spirit and Lord we humble ourselves before you and we make a commitment to seek you but Lord your word says we can ask for anything in your name through Jesus your son and so Lord we humble ourselves and now we also receive from the Holy Spirit who lives within us that gift that we need that gift of faith to believe for that financial miracle that that gift of of healing for our bodies that gift of of discerning between spirits to help us sort out this relationship issue this prophetic gift to somehow Give us comfort and encouragement to believe for that life partner that will come. Lord, we look to you to provide through your precious Holy Spirit whom you have given to us. And we receive now, Lord. We receive. Let there be beautiful signs and wonders and miracles that take place. Answered prayers, not to make us prideful, but to give you glory and to say thank you that it confirms who you are, how great you are, how good you are. Provide for your people right across the Christian Family Centre. Thank you for the Friday morning congregation, for the 8.30 crowd, and for tonight as well, that everyone that's here can receive from you, from your gracious hand. Provide for us, Lord, as we humble ourselves before you. For Jesus' glory and for the strengthening of your church and, Lord, the healing of your people and to make us healing agents in a lost world, those people around about us that need Jesus. We thank you in his name. Amen.